Thank you for coming. I'm Jonathan Brent. I'm executive director of the Evo Institute. And it's my truly great pleasure to welcome all of you here uh, this evening to the inaugural Naomi Prower Kadar Lecture on Yiddish Language Teaching and Culture, which has been established by the Naomi Prower Kadar Foundation to honor the memory of Naomi Kadar. As many of you know, Naomi taught in the Evo Summer Yiddish program for many years and was herself the student of Chava Lapin, one of Evo's board members. <clears throat> she is part of the Evo community, part of the Evo family. And so I am particularly happy that we can now be integral in perpetuating her legacy. I particularly wish to welcome the family of Naomi Kadar, her friends, students, colleagues who have joined us, especially Avraham, her husband, her two daughters, Einat, and Maya, her son Nadav. I wish also to acknowledge Ilana Kuritsky of the Naomi Foundation for her continual and quiet support. <laughs> I'd like to provide a little bit of context to this evening as it uh, reflects what our program states was Naomi's, quote, profound understanding of the importance of preserving culture through language. This is not a small or simply academic concern. The relationship between culture and language has bedeviled much modern history and literature, and it is at the center of Evo's mission. I would like to begin simply by quoting what some important writers have had to say on this subject. Yesterday, I'm quoting, it occurred to me that I did not always love my mother as she deserved and as I could only because the German language prevented it. The Jewish mother is no mutter. To call her mutter makes her a little comic, not to herself, because we are in Germany. We give a Jewish woman the name of a German mother, but forget the contradiction that sinks into the emotions so much more heavily. Mutter is peculiarly German for the Jew. It unconsciously contains, together with the Christian splendor, Christian coldness. The Jewish woman who is called Mutter therefore becomes not only comic but strange. Mama would be a better name if only one didn't imagine Mutter behind it. I believe that it is only the memories of the ghetto that still preserve the Jewish family, for the word Vater too is far from meaning the Jewish father. That was written by Franz Kafka in his diary, October 24th, 1911. Language is the product of a community, and Yiddish reflects the creativity of Ashkenaz. But the link between language and community is even closer. It becomes a co-creator of behavior and of values. Any Jewish community could partake of honey on the eve of the new year to portend a sweet year. But the consumption on Rosh Hashanah of carrots, mern, in allusion to the verb zich mern, to increase, and its combination with a prayer to the effect that may our merits increase, this could be only an invention of the Ashkenazi Jews. That was written by Max Weinreich in the history of the Yiddish language. People, Marxists, who think too simply, who oversimplify very complicated questions of national development, people who don't understand certain interpretations when the whole point is in these interpretations, also don't understand that we want to prepare the elements of an international socialist culture by means of maximum development of national culture and languages. We are conducting a policy of maximum development of national culture so that it can exhaust itself completely and then a base can be created for organizing an international socialist culture in form as well as content. And that was written by Joseph Stalin 18 June 1925, the same year that Evo was founded. When we talk about y Yiddish, therefore, the teaching of Yiddish as a language, we are really talking about the teaching of Yiddish culture and preserving the cultural value of words like mother and father, precisely that Kantomi Prawar Kadar lecture series. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Adina Simet who will say some words about Naomi. 
Dr. Simet was born in Mexico, the daughter of Ruben Simet, a well-known architect and sculptor, and Shoshana Ralski Tar uh, Tartak from Kovno, who is a survivor of the Holocaust. Dr. Simet holds a PhD in sociology from Columbia University and, uh, and is author of Ashkenazi Jews in Mexico, Ideologies in the Structuring of a Community. She was the director and creator of Evo's EPIC program, a monumental initiative for the teaching of Eastern European Jewish history, and was a lifelong friend of Naomi's. Der heutige Abend ist gewidmet zu der Monen der ersten Jahrzeit von Dr. Naomi Praver Kada. Wer es hat gekannt Naomi, weiß, als ist gewähnt Stille, übergegebene Idisch Lehrerin, a ständige Talmide allein, a Mame und a Weib, wo so tief gebäut a prächtige Mischpoche. Sicher ist es überig zu sagen, als es bängt sich noch hier sehr. In Meschach von dem letzten Jahr hat Naomi's Mischpoche sich untergenommen, ach reies dick, nicht nur zu obhitten, noch verstärken und befestigen dem kulturellen idischen Bagage, was die Mame hat übergelassen sei. Naomi's Kinder, was leben sich heus frei und flüssig in der hebräischen Sprache, seinen Itzter mit seiner Taten in einem, stolz und kämpferisch zu verteidigen Naomi's Jerusche. Sie marschieren vor uns mit der Fon für Jiddisch und seinen Gerät abzuhitten die dosige Sprache und Kultur wie ein Teil von seiner eigenen Lebensziel. Die Kadar seinen Heint ein Teil von die Schombre Homos von unserer Kultur und Dor. Es ist unser Wunsch, als es soll matzliach sein in seiner ausgekliebenen Derech. Wir sollen Tage alle kennen, genießen, von einem Satz wachsenden Bäumen mit blühenden Zweigen, in einem Raum, was nimmt darum mit Covid, in diese Sprache und Kultur, die uns alle Menschen zu bereichern. I was Naomi's friend for many years. Although I was in another field of academic work, we shared the love of Yiddish, our mother tongue. We shared an interest in the cultural products of the language that the language embodied. We always spoke in Yiddish to each other. And what is perhaps most surprising with respect to Yiddish, but certainly surprising for any other language, almost always when we met, we spoke about the language and what we needed from it. Naomi became a friend of mine because we shared this world. She felt more deeply that as a Yiddish speaker today, we had limited opportunities in which to live out our interest. She perpetually decried the encroaching of that social cultural space and our inability to either transform the status quo or reverse the trend, thereby creating a new context for ourselves. The subject of these discussions and the depth of the feelings they aroused weighted heavily on her. To review a life as a panoramic picture is itself an exercise of combining temporal layers, the past into the present, and then the present reviewing anew the past. Today, a picture of our meetings together comes to mind. We would meet for lunch or coffee and always spoke with a purposeful agenda. First, we dealt with our independent work projects then we reviewed the immediate goals to improve that which we thought was the unacceptable present. In recent years, we added to our topics reviews of her ideas regarding her PhD studies and writing. We never had time for idle chit chat. It was always a working agenda. From this acquaintance with her work, I realized she demanded much of herself raising the bar for herself continually. As a dissertation topic, she undertook an analysis of American Yiddish children's literature. It was a perfect topic for her. After all, she had been a teacher all her life. But today, it seems to me 
that this was her way of exploring her abilities, not regarding teaching per se, but rather a way to make the field relevant again to the community at large, a way to awaken adults to the importance of the link of language and children. Naomi aspired to reach the heights, but she did it quietly from the angles of her own work while looking at her books. She was building an echo that needed to erupt out of her analysis of those texts. Who imagined that after her passing from a condition whose particulars she shielded from outsiders as a matter of propriety and dignity, I would end up linked to Naomi and her family by helping with a project she would have undertaken herself. So I find myself thinking about her often, and not only tonight when we are honoring her with this inaugural lecture, the first of an ongoing series to be held here at the YIVO Institute. She is also in my thoughts while we're working with a team that is preparing a Yiddish language teaching project that she started to format, expanding on her work in English. The unexpected closeness to her family this year has allowed me a privileged view of my friend. At her levaye and at her shloishim, I saw dozens and dozens and dozens of friends, family, close friends, Hebrew speakers, Israeli friends, older colleagues, students, new colleagues, all adoring the woman I knew as a modest, discreet lady that continually reflected on culture and language. Throughout the year, her family, her children, not to speak of her devoted and adoring husband, have been towers of strength. But more than anything else, they act as a unit in sync propelled towards a social mission. I see a unit walking in unison as if a choir, singing together the one song that she always sang. They are furthering her goals as theirs, as they embrace what they inherited from her. It is stirring to be privy to such energy. The sight is awe-inspiring. Watching this family, I am witness to a sort, a sort of collective rejoicing, a hopeful sight of continuity in a world full of interruptions and misdirection. To anyone who understands how difficult and unpredictable the task of transmitting values from one generation to another is, this panorama is a sight worth recalling and engraving into our minds and hearts. Naomi was proud of her children but she would, have been even more, she would have had even more naches to see their performance as it has evolved today. In this remembrance and tribute to her, while we recognize the Kadars as they further her dreams, I would like to bring forth my own wish. May you continue to walk Naomi's path. May you be able to give life to Naomi's dream. We will all remember her as a quiet, indefatigable fighter. And let us hope that what you are forging on her behalf will indeed take root and yield fruit for our collective benefit and future. Thank you. It's now uh, quite a distinct pleasure to introduce uh, the wunderkind of Yiddish studies worldwide, that is to say, Dovid Katz. Dovid has a reputation that precedes him in practically every continent. Uh, he has had a most remarkable and prolific career thus far. He has taught at numerous universities around the world and is the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship. He is the founder of the Vilnius Program in Yiddish, founder and director of the European Summer Program in Yiddish Studies and Literature, a columnist for the Vorwärts and Allgemeiner Journal, the winner of numerous awards for his Yiddish scholarship translations, founder of the Yiddish Program at Oxford University. From 1999 to 2010, was professor of Yiddish at Vilnius University, Lithuania and is now an independent researcher and author 
Chief Analyst at the Litvak Studies Institute Vilnius, Honorary Research Associate in the Department of Hebrew and Jewish Studies at the University College London, Doctoral Supervisor in Yiddish Studies in Vitautus Magnus University Kaunas. David. Alle kennen do Yiddish oder mit der Frieden heint Englisch? Yes. Yiddish. Yiddish. How many don't understand Yiddish? Raise your Oh, it's about half. Was all men machen? Hmm? Okay, we'll start in English and hopefully we'll be able to uh, do some Yiddish as well because we want everyone to understand. I'm very, very honored. Uh, Paruski at Ochin Ochin Sloj, Mirka Vaznaka Niet, Stodia, Takoya Palajen. I'm very, I'm always very um, emotional when I come back to Yivo. Firstly, because when I was growing up in New York, of course, Yivo was at the conceptual center of my family's and my environment's life. And as it so happens for the last dozen years, I've been a resident at Great Poholanka Street 17, right across the street from Poholanka 14, where uh, Max Weinreich, Zemach Shabbat, and uh, others founded YIVO, and um, only two steps away from Poholanka 18, where it moved uh, several years later. I met Naomi Pravar only once, but I remember very vividly our conversation. It was about the perception. This is decades ago. I'm sure everything's changed now. It was about the perception that those who love Yiddish and want to perpetuate Yiddish as a living language and culture are often not very serious about the scholarly need to master it and to do serious research in it. And our conversation was about how the two should go together, because at the time, there was a perception that some of the serious Yiddish scholars were very far from living Yiddish culture. So that goal of finding ways to synthesize research and the goal of a living Yiddish uh, was what I took with me from my one conversation uh, with Naomi Prager, as I knew her, of course, uh, decades ago. Um, now, the tribe of Yiddish speakers I'm going to talk about, as it happens, is not that of the Prager family. It's the other one, the Litvakes, the northerners. How many here are Litvaks of one sort or another? How many are anti-Litvaks of one sort or another? <laughs> well, let's forget about the standard Yiddish that we sometimes teach. If a native speaker opens his or her mouth, it takes a couple of seconds to find out if the person is a Litvak or a non-Litvak. If it's teire and breit instead of teure and breit, definitely a Litvak. Zogen, Nossen, Cholum, instead of Zogen, Nussen, Cholum, a Litvak. So, and if it's Zogen, Nussen, Cholum, it's the non Litvak, and Zogen, Nossen, Cholum, the Litvak, or Dovid, Duvid. So, these differences come out immediately in the dialect. These are the dialects of Yiddish. The Litvaks are in the northeast there, northeastern Yiddish, the dark blue. They are a minority and always were of East European Yiddish speakers, something like 25%, although we like to think that the cultural output and literary output was perhaps sometimes more. But the southern dialects were much stronger and uh, covered a much larger territory, uh, Ukrainian and Polish Yiddish. This map also has Western Yiddish, uh, Northwestern, uh, Midwestern, and Southwestern that haven't existed for, for quite a while. So that white line that I hope you can see on your map, this is just the Litvish, non-Litvish line in Eastern Europe, the Zogan Zogan line, okay? Um, now, a little bit about Litvak folklore that some of us have forgotten because uh, perhaps a good century or so has passed since many upheavals started uh, <laughs> taking place in, in, in Eastern Europe. Uh, many Litvaks looked back with a great sense of pride and identity to the Grand Dukes of Lithuania, who had been very tolerant and had produced charters of tolerance, Gedimin, now known as Gediminas in Lithuanian, the founder of Vilna in the 1320s. There are no documents for this, but there are many traditions that he invited people of all faiths, religions, backgrounds to help build his new city, Vilna. And in the realm of documents, there are the famous charters of Vitold or Vitautas, as is known today. 
uh, who was called for many hundreds of years Der Litwischer Keirisch. Keirisch? What's she does? Well, standard Yiddish Keirisch, uh, that's Cyrus. So the Jews have a long memory, not only for bad things. They remember the great King Cyrus, with which the Old Testament ends, in fact, that he allowed the Hebrews to return to their ancient, to their city of Jerusalem in the land of Judea after the Persians had conquered the Babylonians who had conquered the Judeans. So Vitold has had acquired a legendary status among Litvakes. Um, all of us East European Jews go back, of course, to the Ashkenazim in Central Europe, who uh, colonized Eastern Europe as a result of many national catastrophes in the, at the time, medievally intolerant Christian societies of Central Europe, the Crusades, the Rindfleisch massacres, the Black Death, much more. And Poland and particularly Lithuania were much more tolerant because they were multi-theist. Multi-theist is our favorite word for what everybody calls pagans. Now, paganism is, of course, tremendously tolerant. I mean, if you worship the stars and the moon and the sea and the tree, you're not going to go kill somebody because he believes Messiah came once, he's coming again. No, he didn't come yet. He's going to come the first time. It's, it's a, and so it's very easy to understand the tolerance further east. And it means that we modern Westerners have to make certain adjustments to see the east as having been rather more advanced in that way. Uh, from the 15th century, you get the word Lito in rabbinic texts, and like very many place names, territory names in Eastern Europe, it has three forms. If it's rabbinic, Hebrew, or Aramaic, it's Lito, spelled with an olive. If it's Yiddish, it's Lite. It used to be spelled with an olive until the Yiddishists in the early 20th century decided to spell it with an ayin as part of the new independent Yiddish legitimization of place names. And among the Zionists from the late 19th century, the Hebraists, it had to be lita with a hey. So uh, Jews sometimes get into fights over spelling and other minor details, which is a sign of a vibrant existence where small details of culture assume importance that they don't to the great national languages and cultures that have an army and a navy, and there's no room for such pleasure. <laughs> um, in rabbinic literature, you have the concept Medinois Lito, the states of Lito, the Grand Duchy. This is a historic map we won't go into too much, just to make the point that the borders of the territory that Jews call Lita coincides pretty well with various incarnations of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. Um, and um, in the centuries of the uh, in autonomy of the Va'ad Arba Arotsis, the Council of the Four Lands, um, again, the parts that were called Lita go very well with what modern Yiddish dialectology has established as, as Litvish. Um, uh, Lithuania and the Litvaks were always much poorer than the Ukrainian or Polish Jews. Uh, in, this is documented, and it's in folklore. And in folklore, it's down to the Orme Litvische Erd was Tegnor af Bulbes, the very poor Lithuanian earth that's only good for potatoes. But, uh, from an early time, from the 16th century, Lithuanian Jewish communities were emphasizing importing great and famous scholars to be their town rabbis. This emphasis on learning, on scholarship, and the beginning of that stereotype of the Litvak as the humorless erudite who's always finding something wrong with everything that other people say. And um, during the War of 1655, two famous uh, Lit Litvish Litvak scholars were exiled. Uh, the Shach to Prague, anybody here from a Talmudic background will know that the Shach and the Taz are two of the rabbinic commentators on the Code of Law on the Shulchan Aruch that always have it out with each other. And there's Moshe Rifkis, an ancestor of the Gaon of Vilna. He made it to Amsterdam, where the very wealthy community couldn't believe what it found. It found a rabbinic scholar from Vilna who knew the whole Talmud and Jewish law rough, more or less by heart. They hired him to be the proofreader of a new edition of the Code of Law, the Shulchan Aruch. But he did far more, that, more than that, being a Litvak. He corrected the text 
And we like to think that he invented the method of textual comparison, looking at all the editions and finding which makes sense, which was the original and how the text became corrupted. That was his Amsterdam Shulchan Aruch with rather risk, a risque frontispiece that you would not find in Jewish East European texts of the time. It was, uh, as you see, it, uh, the, the edition of, in Amsterdam proudly said, that he was beforehand a leader of the Jewish community of Vilna. Okay. You all know about the Gaon of Vilna, the archetypal Litvak. Now, the Gaon of Vilna, this is, by the way, what he really looked like. All the other pictures you've ever seen are fakes. They are 19th and 20th century artists' conceptualizations, very nice artistically, but they're based on German Jewish rabbis with fancy garb. And this, this portrait was done by a Catholic student at what's now Vilnius University who was fascinated by this reclusive rabbi who doesn't want to talk to anybody, doesn't leave the house, uh, and he actually caught up with him in the courtyard of his uh, dwelling to draw this, and a copy was taken by the late Zussia Efron on his way from Lithuania to Palestine in the 1930s, and so this is a copy of a copy of a copy, but it's, uh, it's the real McCoy. You all know about the other Litvaks who became the Chabadnikes. They were also Litvaks to start with, um, the Hasidic movement of uh, eastern Lithuania, and that, too, the picture of its founder, Shnea Zalman, was done by a Christian artist when he was uh, imprisoned. Um, we'll skip a few things here. By the 19th century, um, the Litvische yeshivas became the world center of Talmudic learning, and there were three different strains. There, the ones in blue are the classic Misnagdic yeshivas, the anti-Hasidic ones as we Litvaks are real, Litvaks are anti-Hasidic, of course. The green ones are those of the Musser movement, and that's not taken from the Russian word of a similar sound. It's uh, a pietistic, moralistic movement founded by Israel of Salant in the far west of Lithuania, today Salanta, and it's based on torturing yourself all your life to make yourself a better person. So sort of self-therapy. So they started their yeshivas, and they're in green here. And eventually, in the late 19th century, the Chabad movement started their yeshivas, all called Toimchet Mimim, after the first one in Lubavitch itself. And they're in red. And where you see a yeshiva that's half blue and half red, it means there was a bitter struggle that the Chabadnik has usually won because they were rather more forceful. Now, the Litvak has divided their territory into different regions. Zamet in the far west, it's related etymologically to today's Jemaitia or Samogishia. Reisen in the east, which is often identified with the territory of Belarus. And I'm very happy we have here tonight an expert on Reisen Yiddish. Where is Vitali? Vitali! There he is. Okay, he'll help us later in a different context. Um, who is a Litvak? On our expeditions from 1990 through the present, we've been asking people in Ukraine, uh, in Poland, in Latvia, not only in the Lithuanian lands, where is a Litvak? So a religious person will tell you a misnaget, somebody who follows the Ashkenazic rite and not the Hasidic one in order of prayers is anti-Hasidic. The second definition is someone from the traditional Lithuanian area, Vilne, Kovne, Grodne, Brisk, someone who speaks the Litvish dialect of Yiddish. But in Ukraine, we found that the word Litvak usually meant a Lubavitch Hasid because that was, they were the only Hasidim or almost who spoke a Lithuanian Yiddish and came from up north. And then the most popular definition of a Litvak we found in Ukraine, Zeira Schwerer Mensch, was es ist nit meglach mit dem Oisukumen, was ihr tu nit. And finally, a too serious person with no sense of humor. <laughs> An emissary Litvak. Okay. So if we were trying to define, now I'll begin to bring in uh, dialectology in the years when uh, I was a colleague uh, with uh, Rene Prabhupada, who's here this evening, uh, at the Yiddish Teacher Seminary in Bank Street. I remember 
feeling very jealous of dialectologists of French and Italian and Spanish and English who can go uh, and visit mountains, mountainous villages in Los P and, and try to and, and interview people who speak the language when after the Holocaust it seemed that that was all lost forever and we could only interview expatriates, uh, emigrants, survivors who have been deeply influenced by other dialects, by English sometimes, they say, um, gewocht in street und gesendem next Dorica von der Winde, when I say weiter. So the dream of going back to the old country was only a dream for many years. But uh, during all these years, we found that although the word Litvak has many definitions or none, the word Litvish has survived intact from the Baltic uh, to the Black Sea, especially in the Kherson area, uh, as the Yiddish dialect of Litvish. Uh, I remember when I was arrested once in uh, south of Ukraine, uh, going with tape recorders, and the policeman asked me what I'm doing, and I told him the truth. I'm looking for the old border between Litvish and Polish, between Lithuanian and Polish Yiddish in Ukraine. And unfortunately, he didn't understand what I was saying in the, in the way I meant it. But luckily, luckily, we were traveling with someone who was a better diplomat than myself and, and got us off the hill. Well, there are Mohican issues in the field of Yiddish. No matter how optimistic we are about the future of Yiddish, the generation that came to maturity in pre-Holocaust Eastern Europe is sadly not going to be here forever. And that means that the rest of us, certainly all of us born after the war, have to learn as much as we can from every native speaker from before the war, and all the more so if we can find them in, in situ, in their native land, where there are no younger Yiddish-speaking communities, and where a teacher of Yiddish, as I thought of myself until 1990 when I made my first trip to Lithuania, becomes a student of Yiddish, as I began to think of myself after my first trip to Lithuania. I was deeply influenced by my father, the Yiddish poet Menke Katz. I'm very happy to see his closest friend, son here today, Alvin Steinhardt. Uh, thank you, and thank other friends of the family who've come. Uh, Professor Michal Herzog was my Yiddish dialectology uh, teacher at Columbia, and uh, Dr. Shlomo Noble at uh, Bank Street, as we all called it in that generation. Was it 69 Bank Street, yes? 69 Bank Street, the Yiddish Lehre Seminar, yeah. Um, then I had some thoughts as a Yiddish educator. Wouldn't it be great to bring Yiddish students from around the world after the collapse of the Soviet Union to the homeland to meet these last survivors and be able to breathe in a Yiddish from people who have lived in Ukraine and in Lithuania and in those parts of Poland and the rest of Eastern Europe where they're still to be found. What an opportunity. We didn't dream it would be possible in the 70s or 80s. So the people I've been interviewing since 1990, about 3,000 till now with extensive taped interviews, well, the, the first generation of them went back and in their mind, it was always the gubernias, of course, the provinces of the Russian Empire. To that generation, it didn't matter whether it became Poland or Lithuania or, or Belarus or the Soviet Union after the First World War. Um, the question was, for welcher gubernia seid ihr? And from that, you usually knew if it was Kovna gubernia, Vilna gubernia, Grodna gubernia, Vitebska gubernia, Molivia, it was a Litva. There are some complicated ones, like Suvalk, where the line goes right between. And I have seen some very violent fights over whether a Suvalk is a Litvak or a Pelisher. And of course, it's just a question of uh, <laughs> where in Suvalka they, they came from. But those who grew up in the interwar years have a very different psychological mindset about who they are. If they grew up in the Polish Republic, which could include Vilna, the very heart of Jewish Lithuania, they knew they were Polish citizens, even though they were Litvakers. Only in the Lithuanian Republic, with its capital of Kaunas, Kovna, did the two match. The words matched very well. They live in Lithuania and they're Litvaks. Um, and then, of course, uh, in the Holocaust years, and then Soviet times, and then the whole business of trying to take the map of the person you're speaking to, in other words, taking the map from his or her mind, 
and seeing what you can do with that. So this is a map of, inter of this area, or much of this area, between the world wars, interbellum uh, Eastern Europe. You see that Vilna is in northeast Poland, Kovna is the capital of Lithuania. You see that Poland goes almost up to Minsk, uh, in what is uh, almost all of what is today Western Belarus is northeastern Poland. Um, and here you see the same map with today's borders superimposed in red. And with my good friend Vitali Zaiko in the 1990s, we traveled along that border and we found that people to the um, west of the border were likely to remember a heck of a lot more about folklore, tradition, and religion because they lived in the Polish Republic where all that was free, was freely taught. And those who were on the immediate east of it, if they were not old enough, grew up in the Soviet uh, environment and in the much more limited culture of the Soviet Yiddish school. So we found ourselves uh, uh, literally, that it's a, a border that hadn't existed for half a century was still very much alive in the minds, the language, and the folklore of the people we were looking for. Okay, we're creating an additional digital archive, additional, of course, to the Great Language and Culture Atlas founded by the late Uriel Weinreich, additional to the many projects going on at Bloomington, going on uh, in Kiev and in Minsk. Then there's the humanitarian aspect. Very many of the surviving Jews in Eastern Europe are very poor, and we've been lucky to discover many who were unknown to big Jewish organizations, and uh, when we give their names to the uh, Joint Distribution Committee, they begin to get help, and one of the spin-offs has been the founding of the Survivor Mitzvah Project in California that simply sends cash to poor people. And finally, there are many issues in Eastern Europe revolving around difficulties, anti-Semitism, Holocaust denial, that are topics for another day. Okay, some adventures on the road. Firstly, a general comment. Most of the older Yiddish speakers I've met over the last 20 years in Lithuania, Belarus, Latvia, northeastern Poland, eastern Ukraine, are either much deeper believers than most Orthodox Jews I know today, or they're complete atheists and socialists who haven't got the slightest even even verbal respect for the idea that there's a higher power. So I found this was very much fun that you find, and, and we'll soon meet a couple where there was one of each. Um, there's widespread poverty. There's a lot of pro-Soviet feelings. Um, these people remember that it was the Soviet Union that was the only power fighting the Nazis between 19... Uh, 41 and 1945 or 1944 as it may have been in that part of the world and um, given that many of these people's families were murdered by collaborators from the majority populations in some of these countries the Soviets no matter how much damage the Soviets did to them and their economic life and their religious freedom later they only knew fascism and communism as the two choices and western democracy wasn't out there the vast majority of these people are flight survivors. They're not technical survivors in the sense of those who were in a ghetto, okay, or in a concentration camp. And in Eastern Europe, indeed, there weren't camps, and uh, by and large, there were uh, mass graves. People were shot in mass graves at that, uh, the, the entire area. And many of these people who are still there don't want to move to Israel, America, or Germany, or anywhere else. They feel an obligation. They are the last one in their town to tell visitors what was where or to make a scandal when the local government wants to knock down the old synagogue building and that. One of my first friends and close friends was Ziske Shapiro. He was a barber as, uh, since he passed away, as you see. my. <laughs> I haven't found anybody to, to replace him, but I'm a loyal, I'm a loyal kind of guy. Um, now, Ziske loved all the old prayers, and he would say a beautiful Kaddish on El Moli whenever we'd come to a Jewish. He accompanied me on a total of thousands of miles of expeditions. I would knock on his window and say we're going, and he didn't even know I was coming to Lithuania. We'd go for a few weeks. Um, 
This was not a man for the post-Soviet era. I remember a year after the Soviet Union collapsed, I happened to be in his little wooden chata, his little wooden hut, when a young man with a, what do you call it, a clipboard. A clipboard came and said, for, a, I think it's $4, you can now buy your house. It's just a registration fee. It's yours. You live here. We're privatizing the houses. And Ziske started screaming at him, you killed us all, and now you want me to buy the house from you? Get out of here. I'm a socialist. It belongs to the people. <laughs> and then his big tragedy came when his barber shop was privatized. And three women whom he had taught the art of hairdressing bought it. And he didn't want to buy it because he's a socialist. So he would stand outside and tell men not to go into this capitalist pig barbershop and that he would add afterwards that for a man to have his uh, hair cut by a woman amounts to suhoi ananism, which I won't <laughs> translate. Um, this is the late Bluma Katz, a very different character. She was a one-woman encyclopedia of pre-war Vilna and Yivo, a student of Max Weinrach from the late 1920s. We have about 100 hours of videotape memories with her, and she lived in Svencian, 90 kilometers, about 45 miles north of Vilna. Avrom Yankiv Berchi Fantenrad Ashkovitz, and Vitali remembers him very well, was a deeply religious man. He fled on the 25th of June, 1941, uh, with about 22 communists who fled. Now, the commun Jewish communists fled because they knew what was coming to them when, when the Nazis were invading. But he, he fled with them one way or another, and he cut his little prayer book into four, putting a one quarter of it into each side of his boots as a Soviet soldier, and he never missed a prayer until, until his death several years ago. And um, we had promised him we would help him find his father's grave in the old cemetery, and we finally did. That's him talking Yiddish to his goat, of which we have a beautiful video that we can uh, hopefully play uh, next time. Here is somebody very different, Liebe Krenitsky of Mir, who was a communist revolutionary in the 1930s. Her husband uh, moved to the Soviet Union and was promptly shot, of course, as a Polish spy. And in our interviews, I asked her, how can you forgive them? They shot your husband for not? No, it's worse. I said, a revolution wasn't found. I'd be selling um, And she hugged her little bust of Lenin every day. Um, but in her graveyard, um, we, we saw this broken Jewish gravestone that she found somewhere, Ishoch Shuvo Vikora Moras Gittel. I said to her, what is this doing here? She says, I live a communist, but I want to die a Jew, and my neighbors know to put it on my grave. But I said, was tut sich mit euch? Ihr seid doch Liebe und da steht Gittel. You are Liebe and this is Gittel. A voice fan of Kemine, Liebe, Schmiebe, Gittel, Schmidt. This is Feigitschke Joffe in Utjan, oops, in Utjan, today Utene. Um, Ziska and I, had spent a day in Utyan, very upset. We found nothing and nobody, but we both had a feeling that if we hang around, we'll find something. So we uh, found an old lady sitting in front of the church and asked her if there's anybody of Jewish origin. And she said, well, if you give me Washington, I will tell you. Washington means a dollar. I quickly pulled out a dollar, and she got very insulted, of course, because in Eastern Europe, and in the mid-1990s for sure, if the dollar was creased with a little mark, with a little tear. <laughs> so in the end, we found a, a beautifully crisp $20 bill. And, and um, she sent us to this woman who was saved by the priest in uh, Abolnik, now Vabalninkas, um, on condition that she would be baptized. And she had not spoken Yiddish since 1941. She thought that nobody in town ever knew that she had been Jewish, least of all her second husband. I think even on this primitive photo, you see from his face, he's not exactly happy uh, to, to see us. Um, she apologized uh, for having forgotten Yiddish in 1941. What do you want? It's 
late 1990s. Uh, after half an hour, something snapped, and she came out with the most beautiful, pure pre-war Yiddish I had ever heard in my life, not affected by anything from the war years or after, like the archaeology of the mine. So we became friends, although she was always a little upset with me that I didn't accept a fellow that she called uh, Mashiach. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But there, there we are. And that's her with her in later years. Uh, Fegeleia Katz is still alive in Volna. She also converted to Christianity and was saved by the priest in uh, Varne, Vorne, in far western Lithuania. But unlike um, Fegich Kiyofa, she very much wants, in her, she's about 90 now, wants to reconvert to Judaism. Unfortunately, the three feuding rabbis in Vilna have no time to take any time off from their feuding to help her, so we're going to have to leave it at that. In Drisa, Verch Nedvinsk, um, Hirsch and Pinya were very dear friends, but Hirsch was a communist and Pinya religious and they would have these big fights every day. And that was saying goodbye to them, and this is a town that you still have to reach with the parom, the ferry. Okay, so, and the ferry runs on drag ropes, just like in the old days, yeah. Now, Vital, where is he? Could you stand up? He looks exactly the same today. He's at the far right of this photo. Vital was our guide in 1993 and 1995 on various expeditions. And Vitali and we were traveling um, westward from Minsk when we saw a sign, Disna. Well, if you've ever studied Yiddish literature, you get really excited. Moshe Kulbach's Disna Child Herald. So we quickly changed the route. We went to Disna, and we were told that there's only one last Jewish couple alive, Mendel and Shifre Svedlov. You see them there in the middle with the ubiquitous Ziske Shapiro, my barber, um, in the far left. <laughs> uh, we stayed for several days in a um, hotel. How would you describe it, Vitaly, the hotel? In I think it was, I think you, at the time you called it Gastinitze Tarakan. <laughs> the bread um, and If I remember correctly, you slept in the car. You said, I'm not, I'm not having it. Anyway, this couple decided that Vitali, who's here with us, would make the perfect husband for their daughter, whom we never met, because she lived in Latvia, in Dvinsk, in Daugavpilsk. And Vitali, in a perfect Yiddish, said, Oberich bin agoi. <laughs> so the idea of a non-Jew who would learn Yiddish was to them so impossible, so exotic, that their only reply to that was, and what a sense of humor he has. He says he's a goy. Um, with great difficulty, I'm sorry the story ended very tragically uh, with them, not with Vitali, who's very happily married with a wonderful family here in, uh, in New York. And of course, worked the evil many, many, many years. Um, this family and this couple had a debate which we had, I had heard over the, my two decades many times. He desperately wanted to move to Israel and to die, i.e., Dafshtab Menert Yisroel. And Shifre said, No, I'm going to die and be buried near where my mother is buried in the mass grave, which was about a 10 minute walk through the forest from their home. And finally, 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 they thought they had reached agreement to get the papers to emigrate. And sadly, she took her life and uh, hanged herself and, and wanted to die and to be with her mother. In Smolovich, not to be confused with Smilovich, famous for Chaim Sutin, and the local pronunciation is Sutin. You know, all these guys, Meshke Segal became Shagal, and this uh, Sutin became Sutin when they got to Paris. But in, in Smolovich and Smilovich, they were Sutin. Um, so this was a marriage of a devout communist who actually fought in the Tsar's army. He was 100 years old when we found him, uh, 1998. Uh, he fought in the Tsar's army and then continued in the Soviet army. But his wife, Peshke, 
uh, was deeply religious and spoke to God for hours every day in the old cemetery near the stones of her, of her mother and her grandmother. And um, well, we've taped many of their uh, uh, arguments about God and about socialism. And uh, uh, when, he, when he would say that science is getting ahead of religion, she would say, They'll never be able to make a fly. Yeah. Um, during the, Stalin, the late Stalin years, when there were very dire punishments for observing any kind of Jewish life, as in uh, Siberia and hard labor, there were a number of secret synagogues throughout the area, and Yiddish developed a special word for these, a davenstub, a, um, a room or a house for praying. And the late, um, the father, the actual uh, not real rabbi, but the, the religious Jew who kept it going had been long dead by the time we got there. This was his son, uh, Leza, who guarded everything as a sort of monument. You see the very unusually high fence, so nobody would see or hear anything from the street. Um, that's his sister, uh, Merke, and they are near the cupboard where they kept all the books. And it's very touching that the one, one page that was separate and was very, very um, overused and overread and read to pieces was the, the um, ceremony for marriage because many of the Jewish couples in town, this was in Polotsk, by the way, in, uh, in northern uh, Belarus, uh, would uh, secretly get married according to Jewish law there as well. And many of the books were in covers that said Stalin or Lenin, and inside they were prayer books. And in the end, we bought the whole collection from them, and so that's now in Vilna. Meir Kestola, who uh, has, has survived on the day when the Jews of Radin were murdered in uh, 1943, he, um, uh, he hit the god, who, his German god, with a shovel, ran into the forest, joined the partisans, this is Shimke Julik of Svensjan, who was a wagoner, um, a wagon driver. His Yiddish was full of the most magnificent curses that I have far too much respect for you to repeat. But there was only one word in the Yiddish language that he couldn't take and that would drive him to violence, and that was the word balagole. He had to be a forman, not a balagole, because a forman was the elegant, coachman, okay? And the Balagola was what he really was. Um, and here he is showing us the most infamous brothel in pre-war Vilna on Klein Stefangas. No disrespect to all the other residents of uh, Mala Stepanska. And um, these are some of my friends today in Vilna, Melach Stalevich. Um, he came back to Vilna after the war to say goodbye for one last time in 1946. As he was at the train station leaving for Russia, a Polish guy recognized him from before the war and said, I saw your mother yesterday. She's alive. He said, it's impossible. Everybody was killed. And the Polish guy said, come, we'll find her. And after 10 minutes, he found her at this spot. And here's where they lived until her death in 1984. And here's where he lives until today. OK, and nowadays, we often return to a shtetl. This is Dobke Yonis, born in Zhezmer in 1913. She turns 98 this week, has a perfect mind and memory. That's a dreidel she made in the Stalinist years in the factory where she worked. This is taking her back to her shtetl, Zhezmer. So because very few Jews wanted to live in the shtetl after the war, with all the horrible memories and being the only Jew, they would live in the big city. And it's our practice to go back with them for a day to show us and tell us everything in Yiddish, of course. And that's the late Hirsch Speckel in his home in Vilkomia. OK, um, how much time do we have left? OK, you'll, you'll, you'll give me a five minute noise. Yeah, because now I want to come to a little bit of what we're doing with Yiddish dialectology, which may be of, of, of lesser interest to some, so just compare it. Um, okay, so what we're doing with the atlas is trying to see what we can rescue from a tiny remnants of a destroyed population. You all know that there's a very boring language called standard Yiddish, you know. 
So in standard Yiddish, it's so boring that the word for the bird, a pigeon or a dove, toib, is the same as the word for deaf, toib. But there is no Yiddish dialect in which those two words are the same. If you're Polish, uh, if, if you're a Polish Yiddish speaker, deaf is toib, and the bird that flies is a tob. Okay? If you're Ukrainian, deaf is toib, and the bird is a tub. If you're a standard Litvak, deaf is teib, er is teib videvan. Um, and uh, toib is what flies. But when we went through this territory, we found a whole bunch of exotic differences in zamet, taub, teib, taub, tob, and so again, saving some linguistic detail. Sometimes something comes up in the history of Yiddish. For example, the word for potato, which is extremely prominent in the Lithuanian lands. And where the potato is as important as snow is to the Eskimo, there are different kinds of potatoes. The most exquisite were called roseve bulbus, pink potatoes, that had a hue that were not white. But the basic word for potato uh, in Eastern Lithuania, uh, bulbe, and in Western Lithuania, bulve. In one case, close to the Belarusian, and in the other case, close to the Lithuanian. But when we found a few guys in their 90s, they remembered that their grandparents didn't say bulbe or bulve. And they certainly didn't say kartoffel, which for them was not even Yiddish, it was German. They said erdap, in their mind, I mean it was German. They said erdapel. So we know that erdapel, earth apple, is the older Yiddish word, and that it shifted to bulbe and bulve only during their grandparents' lifetimes. So when you interview someone who's 90, who remembers a 90-year-old grandparent from when they were 10 or 10 years old, okay, you have a historic depth that is tragically completely lost when these people go. Um, the word for face in Yiddish, anybody here can offer some? Ponim? Where are you Polish people? Come on. Ponim! We will not have ponim in the, in, in the face of the Proverbs. We have to have ponim as well. Now, I always thought that ponim was the Litvish word until I became a student of Yiddish by traveling around and looking for these old people, when I found, first of all, that for very many Litvakes, um, ponim meant the whole face, but tsure meant the lower face. And it was often used as a general word. It's from Hebrew tsuro, modern Hebrew tsura, form. But in, in Litvish Yiddish in the West, it was this part of the face. And that often worked for the whole face. Then there were many places where ponim was a nice word. It meant a handsome or beautiful face. And tsure is an insult. Fea mi se tsure. And we found this in Ukraine even where uh, it would be tsire and not tsure, but the same difference. So we find continuities across dialects. In some towns, tsure can only mean an animal's face. So if you have a beloved pet, a cat or a dog, you cannot talk about its ponim. You have to talk about its tsure. And if, God forbid, it dies, um, OK, so a whole range of semantics of Yiddish, that a big part of which could have been lost, can still be recovered. Well, the different kinds of Litvaks can always be classified by the word feir. Yes? Well, Oya is completely unknown to any real Litvak, unless their Yiddish was ruined in a Yiddish school, then they would. <laughs> uh, this is actually true in a certain sense, in the dialectological sense, where you're looking for the real dialect word and not the standard word. If somebody in Lithuania says Oya, that's what they learned in a Yiddish school. You know? And then they say, what did you say at home? If it was in the far west of Lithuania, it's Oya. If it's in the Kovna area, it's anybody? Eyer. And if it's in eastern Lithuania, Belarus, it's Ever. So Ever and Ever. Um, most probably Ever arose because Ever happens to be inconveniently homophonous with a certain part of the male anatomy. In Eastern Lithuania, most people we asked about the word homentaschen insisted that's not Yiddish. It's a German word. 
And of course, the tash probably is what got them because they know that keshena is a pocket in Yiddish and in German, some kind of tash. But homentash is daish, but the Germans don't you know, they keep poor them. They don't make homentash. And the word is hometes or homentes. And that's another line, a very old line between Eastern and Western Lithuania. We've often found that the difference, that the transition from non-Litvish, Polish and Ukrainian to Litvish, can actually be gradual. It isn't always abrupt. For example, the plural, ihr seid. And down south, it would be ihr, yes. ihr sind. OK. So what we found was this strip that you see in pink here in the southeast, where you have, we found transitional forms, ihr seid, OK? Ihr sind, ihr seid, ihr sind, and then ihr sind. But the two middle forms, seid and sind, uh, Zeint and Zant have been lost. So all we know now is Zeit and Zent, the two extremes of the continuum, and dialectology can fill in uh, many things there. Then there's a very special dialect of Yiddish known as Chernobler Yiddish. Yes, that one. It's Litvish except for one vowel that's deep non-Litvish. The U is E. Okay, so Kumen is Kimen, but Zogen is still Zogen. And in Borough Park today and elsewhere, in certain places in Israel, if you find real Chernobyl Hasidic families who follow Rebar and Chernobyl, um, they speak this very exotic dialect. Um, there's a wonderful woman alive in Kiev, born in Chernobyl, Rocho Rusakovsky, and she came from a mixed marriage, a father from a few miles away from where the mother was born. Um, so her father spoke Chernobyl Yiddish, bade them for attic, echit for also, federen for feathers, geboren for born, zogen say, keller seller. But her mother was born in Ivankev, just south, in other words, Ukrainian Yiddish, boidem for Arik, Oichet for also, Fidaren for feathers, Geboyeren for born, Zugen for say, and Kila for seller. So you see how one woman in a very poor apartment in Kiev has in her mind a whole border, not only of dialect, but of cultural differences, because her father's side were, of course, Chernobyl Hasidim originally, and she knew all about it, even if her uh, father uh, wasn't observant. Turning to the far left of uh, the far left, the far west of Lithuania, left of your map, what was left of this exotic Zameter Yiddish. And I want to mention my friend and teacher of my youth in New York, Wolf Yunin, who was determined that I would be able to write my term paper about Zameta Yiddish at Columbia University by putting announcements in his column in the for, in the first in the talk, then in the forwards, in, in his column Sprachwinkel asking for people from that area to come forward, and we found nobody. So you can imagine how badly I felt that Wolf wasn't around uh, 20 years later when in Western Lithuania we found uh, the last people who spoke this dialect. Um, this is uh, Freitke Jochelovich. Um, she spent months and months racking her brains for everybody she knew before the war as a little girl, and she came up with the 14 towns in Western Lithuania, and as she wrote on top, and so the, the towns and shtetlach where the people spoke as I did. And she wrote the Yiddish names, Telz, Telshe, Salant, Salanta, okay, and, and so on. So again, this is the magic of a living person, of one person, when the whole society is gone, but there is a remnant. The late Itzke Gavende remembered his family's ideas about the border between Lita and Reisen, and he actually gave me a 50-page dissertation with lists like this, how they say it in Lita, that's on the right, and how in Reisen, both areas, uh, this border would have been in what's now uh, eastern Lithuania, uh, now not far from the Belarusian border. Some of you may have read articles by the late Dr. Hariton Berman uh, of Ukraine, so we would, um, where am I here? Sorry, we would send him maps and he would draw the line on the map 
between the, the different dialects as he remembered. That was his letter accompanying one of them. Sometimes we found that a standard Yiddish word didn't exist at all. Like, what's the plural of the word nar, meaning a fool? Naronim. Yeah. So we found after a while that anybody who said naronim had that from the Yiddish school, not from home. That at home it was always naroyim in real Litvish Yiddish. Okay. And those who insisted on Naronim admitted, finally, that their parents said Naronim. Now, they were loath to admit that because it was the job of the Yiddish school to teach standard Yiddish. This is not a criticism. It's just an operational problem of the dialectologist to go beyond education to the real linguistic facts. The same with paradise. Not Ganeden, but Ganeidim, okay, with an M. And the word where we could find absolutely no pattern and hundreds and hundreds of variants was the word for everything. Altsikading, alding, altsding, altsinesding. Uh, everything but the standard Yiddish form that uh, maybe some pattern will yet emerge. I want to finish with a plug for our Jewish Lithuania program in Vilnius uh, this summer. If anyone is interested, the director, Professor Mikhail Yoso, is here. Uh, it's a two-week program to find out all about the world of these very difficult Litvakes. So thank you. And if there are any questions, <laughs> No. Ah, in Eastern Europe, we have to clap back. <laughs>